All right, so now we are going to talk about various turning points in World War II. And first, I'd like to apologize. This is going to look a lot more like world history than U.S. history, but in order to really understand the U.S.'s role, we really just have to understand what happened during World War II. So if this is a review for you, if you already had world history, my apologies. All right, so first thing we got to know is where we started from. So at this point, in the very beginning of the war, Germany has the advantage. They had been very sneakily building up their their war machine for the better part of five or six years prior to the U.S. becoming involved. So they had just had a huge amount of tanks, U-boats, submarines, uh, naval vessels for a country that has a very, very small amount of water uh, ports in any way. And they just taken over a lot of territory by this point through annexation, like with uh, the Sudetenland or through uh, armistice with the annexation of uh, Austria, and they had become extremely, extremely, extremely strong. Now, they also engaged in conscription, which is based on the draft. They had the strongest nation in Europe for a little while, and possibly in the world, depending on how you look at things. Now, by this point, we're talking about a fighting force that was what we would call a war machine. It was just every part of Germany was designed to push out and enforce and help their military. Whether you were a student at a school or a teacher, you might be teaching people about nationalism and German pride. Like There's image, terrible image of German school teachers teaching their kids how to differentiate between an Aryan or someone of German ancestry, according to Hitler, from a Jewish person or from some other quote-unquote undesirable group. Like of that kind of, It was all designed basically to propagate this idea of the Aryan race being in some way superior to other races, and that's the whole idea behind it. And every one of those things pushed further out this ideology of nationalism, national pride, which further helped engage people when they enlisted in the military, through conscription and the draft, all this stuff just fed into Hitler's war machine. Uh, the first thing we got to talk about is Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg means lightning warfare. Now, this is really in response to Hitler's experience that he had while he was in World War One. He was a courier during World War One, and he would go back and forth from trench to trench, and he got to see the bodies and the mangled and the fact that thousands upon thousands of people were dying to acquire what amounted to about 500 yards of territory. At at some time. So you're talking about itty bitty gains for lo huge loss of life. So Hitler was like, well, I'm not going to do that. So he did what's called Blitzkrieg. That's where you just send in everybody all at once. It's a shock and all kind of warfare. It's like you run in and you blow them away. That, and that's how you get in. And then you, you, you just overwhelm them quickly and they surrender fast. And that's how they invaded Poland. It's the most famous example. They just burst right in. And the movement was so so fast. It was September 1st, 1939, they invade Warsaw, and this is the beginning of World War II by Germany, really. This is the real beginning of the war in Europe, is when Poland gets invaded, because this is an act of war. The Polish fought back. This is this is warfare happening. All right, the fall of France. I'm sorry, this is a very text-heavy slide. The fall of France was 1940, the German invasion of France, low countries, the phony war, quote-unquote. It lasted nine whole days. They tried to rescue soldiers from uh, Dunkirk, and they were trying to basically just escape France. France was, and understand this, France was in a bad position. One, because they were still somewhat decimated from World War One. They lost a lot of people, but they were also not prepared to go up against Hitler's war machine at that point. So this is after Poland's been taken over, after Austria. They had the manpower to put a lot of people down where France was basically abiding by the Treaty of Versailles rules and not really building their military up, kind of naively when you look back at it, but they just didn't have the stuff to fight them off, and they couldn't because everybody was all about appeasement. They were trying to appease Germany, let's prevent war. And then by the time it was all said and over and you kind of fed and appeased the German wolf, he was a lot bigger and stronger than you were, and you couldn't stop him from eating you. All right, then on June 25th, France finally surrenders. And he, the Germans required them to sign the documents in Copenhagen, sorry, Copien, in the same rail car that Germany had been compelled to sign the armistice ending World War One. So basically, to add insult to injury, where German Germany had to sign their like defeat papers, their surrender, they made the French sign the exact same in the exact same place just to kind of insult them. 
All right, so this is now occupied France. This is what it looks like. You see the the coastal military zone where they basically have all the, all this other various things going on. You have the batteries and armaments all up and down this coast, also up here too to a certain extent. But you, this just a me. It's a it's a it's a territory at this point. France is not France anymore. It's occupied. There's a free area of France down here, but they're still fighting. This is where a lot of the fighting's taking place. They're going back and forth because you got. And look, because at this point, France and certainly the free zone in France is kind of between a rock and a hard place. You got you got Spain down here, weak country, neutral, don't have the manpower, don't have the people. Then you got the it- the Italians coming in. Then you got the Germans up top. They're kind of being it's like a pincer motion, like a crab. They're just squishing them down in, inside a vice grip. Now it's really scary. Got a phone call. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, if you go to, you think about Germany, they they got this pincer motion, but the real problem is no isn't so much France is gone. That's terrible, and that they're kind of just barely staying alive. This is the problem. The English Channel. You have this is a tiny spit of water right here, guys, where you can meet up and, and bomb London. At this point, Germany went from being way over here, which meant that the UK was safe. You can easily send bombers out this way. You can easily get from the Normandy of Normandy here across the UK to Portsmouth or London. It's not hard anymore. Now the UK is in it. They can't avoid it. They have to sit. They're they're now on their they're on their heels at this point because France was kind of the buffer zone. France is gone. There's the same map again from earlier. All right, the Germans marched through the Arc de Tri. Arc de Triomphe. I'm going to mispronounce every single time. Through the Arc de Triomphe. It's a very famous uh, landmark inside of Paris. And this was, again, insult to injury, having Germans walking through and marching, doing their goose step all the way through there. It was basically just to insult France, say, ha, we won. And here's a, here's a cartoon. Basically, this is the French maiden sign of the armistice with a gun and knife, gun to her head and a knife to her throat. All right, the influence of propaganda. Propaganda kind of gets a bad rep. Pop- propaganda is advertising. That's all it is. It's advertising for a goal, and every single country used it. Now, the most famous examples of World War II propaganda are obviously the anti, anti-Semitic, anti anti-Jewish propaganda that was put out by Germany, which is obviously terrible and false in most ways. But the idea behind propaganda is to promote some effort, whether it's advertising for a war, advertising for a political party, whatever. The idea is to advertise and make people like what you're putting out there. War posters, deliver us from evil. Obviously, there's a big religious connotation to that. Buy war bonds. A war bond, guys, was a... Uh, basically, you would lend money to the government and they'd pay you back a little bit of interest at the end of the war when they paid back the bond. It was a, t- it was a way to raise money. And they would do everything they could to get people to buy war bonds, save, save metals, conserve, conserve... Say every time you buy every time you buy this, you're helping out Hitler. Every time you buy this, you're, every time you buy too much bread, you're taking bread out of the mouths of our soldiers in Europe. That kind of stuff, trying to promote this national obligation to the war effort. Newsreels, probably the most famous way people actually found that about the war, because up until this point. You had movies and you had talkies, but you didn't really have much in the way of movies and talkies during a major military te- uh, event happening. So World War One, yeah, it was terrible and awful, but there wasn't much footage being put out to the masses. Now you have movies, and now you have what would be, like before a movie would play, a newsreel would come out saying this week in history or this week in during the war. They and they basically just summarize things. Also during this time period, they start not always being as censorship oriented because it used to be everybody's happy. We're going to war. We're fighting off those darn Nazis. It would look good. Other times they put out, these are the bodies of our U S Marines dead with the waves lapping up on them. The people were seeing war differently for the first time, really in U S history that can, in a in a way that they can look at and go, wow, that's not a picture. That's not a photograph from like the civil war. That's not a painting or an artist's rendition. That's, someone's son on the beach in in the middle of Pacific with the waves lapping up on his body who's never going to stand up again. It became very, very real. 
pamphlets were a big tool. They'd send out all right, pro, um, they put they were put out a lot by the British. It told the history. In this case, this is a mine sweeping. It told the history of what mine sweeping was and what they were what they did. And as you can imagine, being a minesweeper is kind of dangerous because if you mess up, you step on a mine, explode, and die. So it was hard to get people to want to do that. So this was a great way to like say, this is what minesweepers do. This is the role they play. This is how important you'll be if you join up with us as minesweepers. It was a big job. It was an important job that didn't get a lot of real press to it. It wasn't like as it wasn't as like the stuff that myths are made of. So they had to put out propaganda that says, Hey, these guys are doing some amazing stuff. The closest thing I think of it would be like the movie, the hurt locker about bomb techs in um, in Iraq, basically trying to disarm IEDs and how crazy that is. Same kind of, same kind of concept. Airdrops used to drop pamphlets and supplies, to civilian soldiers advancing on enemy lines in hard to get areas. A lot of this would be, um, they would if, propaganda. Let's say uh, you want to encourage the local populace to rebel or support your side. You drop food and stuff for them. Say, hey, we're still on your side. We know things are hard. Here, thank you for th- Amer- thank you, America. Thank you for all you're doing. Um, they do it also with things like it, like it's very famous in the in the uh, in Stalingrad where they actually just blared over loudspeakers propaganda saying, leave your leave your country we will come you come here we will take care of you and protect you that's also propaganda similar in nature the four freedoms this is norman this is norman rockwell right here guys these are four norman rockwells we got freedom of speech freedom of worship freedom of want freedom from fear so this is a very famous one that was listed out by franklin delano roosevelt it got it a lot of U.S. foreign policy, and they used it for a great deal of propaganda. It's one of those great speeches in history. You're like, freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of religion, and freedom of speech. It was a big deal. It, like, harkened back to the American ideal. And Norman, this is Norman Rockwell coming out with this amazing set of what is propaganda. It's American propaganda. It's still propaganda just pr- to promote what they're fighting for and to put an idea or, or an ideology behind the war effort. All right, so like I said before, December 8th, 1941, at 4.10 p.m. Eastern Time, so North Carolina time, Congress approved a declaration of war against Japan. A date which will live in infamy. So that's actually straight out of FDR's statement. He's like, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The Empire of Japan suddenly and deliberately attacked Pearl Harbor, basically saying... We're ticked off, and they did this with no provocation, and now we are going to go to war with them. All right, Stalingrad. I mentioned it very briefly, but Stalingrad was a big turning point on the Eastern Front with Germany against the USSR, Russia. Basically, it was a um, time where St- Stalingrad is named after Joseph Stalin, the, the, who was the dictator, essentially, of the USSR. Hitler was going after Stalingrad, kind of as like insult injury like well i'm gonna go after the town you're named after that kind of deal and it was a big deal because the russians beat them back the russians should not have been able to beat them back the germans had more experience they had better soldiers everything there's a very famous movie called um enemy at the gates basically about snipers in during the time of stalingrad because it's a long drawn out battle and uh, they were able to stop the advance in there and there are scenes where basically <laughs> the opening scene and I'll actually try to get you a video of it, so don't worry about it right now. After you watch this video, remind me, and I'll show you the opening scene to Stalingrad, because it is amazing. It's very interesting just how the Russians didn't value life in a very strange way in order to save their country. All right, so this is World War II, 1942 to 1944. Take a look at what's happened. This map is now all yellow. It's all controlled by the Axis, and 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 so Germany, Italy... And you have um, in Japan way over off screen, but you can't see it, obviously. So they have taken over a huge portion of area during this time period. And here are some frozen up Germans. Uh, uh, this I think this is from when uh, uh, Hitler pushed into Russia in the middle of winter. This is from Stalingrad. It's just some dead soldiers in the sand. They just they couldn't pick them up. All right, this is what Stalin. This is the actual Stalingrad layout right here. So this is what it looks like when, they're, when the Germans are kind of going in these specific areas, trying to push through Leningrad up up, up top. If you notice, they use the term Leningrad. It is no longer Leningrad. It w- used to be called um, Saint Petersburg. 
Then when the communists took over, they called it Leningrad. Then after the communist wall fell, they changed the name back to St. Petersburg. So this is the push out of Poland by the Germans in black. They get to Kiev, and then they just go nuts and run straight to Stalingrad. And they're trying to just take over. And it was a big, big push. And they got deep into, deep, deep, deep into Russia before they were able to push him back. All right, on to D-Day, Operation Overlord. All right, so D-Day with Operation Overlord, June 6, 1944. The Allied invasion of Normandy led by Dwight Eisenhower later becomes president. This is the turning point for Western Europe. And this is where it's go- taking place. So you're talking about all these various places. From We're going from England across the Strait of Dover all the way into this area right here. So they're starting down here. Oops, sorry, I keep messing this up. There are a system of ports all through here, and they're going to push down. And you'll see in this map right here, same area. They're pushing down Canadians, Americans, Brits, all pushing all to these various beaches where they got to basically push in to take over. Now, the reason why they're able to do this, and you're probably asking, well, why didn't the Germans just put up a ton of defenses? Well, they had a ton of defenses, but we had put out some fake propaganda, some fake intel saying we would be way over here. We were going to go up in this area and attack here. So Hitler sent all his stuff down this down up here, thinking they were going to attack, and he left this place relatively less enforced and less taken care of. So when we came in, we were able to get in a little bit easier, although to say it was easy would be just wrong. Here's another quick map of it. Pause it here, review over the map, just take a look at it. It's pretty interesting Just see what's going on. And just some examples of the things they did to try to stop movements of ships and troops onto the beach. It was extremely well protected. All right, in the next, chap- next section, we'll get into George Patton. 